And the message Pastor Jerry wanted to make sure was relayed is that he will be back next week. So uh, they had some time of vacation this week, uh, some time of helping out at another church that is opening uh, a much larger sanctuary and all the details that go into bringing and pulling that all together. So he's helping out there. He's a good friend like Pope McHagan in uh, Jackson. And, but he'll be back uh, right here next Sunday. So it's a pleasure today to, to get back onto the Hero series with Hero number four. And I was, like, was and am and will always be excited about this person. It's Nehemiah. Nehemiah in the Old Testament, the rebuilder of the wall around Jerusalem is what he's most known for. And I've, I've had the privilege of, of uh, leading different groups through some books on Nehemiah, and he, there is just so much there. And uh, I want to, there's excellent lessons on leadership. I, I want to encourage you right now to, to listen, listen to some of the things that are in this book, and I believe it'll touch everybody's lives. There's excellent lessons on leadership, there's how to handle threats physical and verbal, slander, social networking. There might as well, the, the term Facebook might as well have been listed here because how he handled attacks and slander and threats in a way, the way that he handled it is amazing, and I think we could learn a lot from that in terms of how we handle things, especially on our social media. There, he, was, he was involved and behind and, and the thrust behind a spiritual renewal. Uh, he, would, he dealt with corrupt leadership, how to do that, and, and, and have that, the right changes come about, how to, prior, how to prioritize multiple demands, that fits Many of us here, how to, how to keep the most important the most important. How to inspire others to contribute and be part of the solution. How to not just survive, but to thrive in, sp in spite of overwhelming opposition and odds. I, if there was anything I could do, if I could stand on my head, if it would get some of you to read the book of Nehemiah, I would do it. I would probably hurt myself too, but... <laughs> It is packed with, with many, many things that would be a benefit. And I'm just uncovering just one thing, or one, this, I'm getting into one, just touching on the second chapter this morning. So I'm just, just getting started with this. But <clears throat> a little history before we get started. The Jews, Jerusalem was the capital of the Jewish world. It was, it was, it was not a small town, it was a big city. And that was where uh, Solomon, David first, and then Solomon reigned, and we've heard about the temple that was built, this magnificent temple. We've heard about the walls that were built around that city to provide protection. So Jerusalem uh, was, was the capital of the Jewish world. <clears throat> but it was conquered by the Babylon, by the Babylonians, and the Jews were taken about 750 miles away from that city to Babylon. The Babylonians, Babylonians would do that. They would, they would wipe an area out. They would take their citizens, bring them back, and then incorporate those citizens into their lifestyle, their life. And over time, uh, not in two years, five years, but over generations, people would assimilate and they would be part of the, their culture. The Medes, and the, uh, the Medes and the Persians then conquered the Babylonians. And in, in, there was a prophecy that was given when the, when, this, when the city was conquered. And it was that you would be in captivity for 70 years. And in fulfillment of that prophecy, uh, Cyrus, who was the king of Persia, remember the Persians conquered the Babylonians now, Cyrus released the Jews to go back to Jerusalem. He said, he said they could go back. 
Now, I find this amazing, and, and we don't have a, a fully accurate census or anything, but it is believed that 70% of those that were captured in there and their offspring stayed in Babylon, and only 100,000 or not quite 100,000 Jews returned to Jerusalem. So they, the, the Babylonian way worked. Their, the people got assimilated, got comfortable, got attached, and, and they stayed. But those that returned, returned to a city that was, that was still demolished. <clears throat> Sometime later, Ezra, one of the priests, one of the Jewish priests, took a, back, a group back to rebuild the temple. Uh, so that was, that was laid on Ezra's heart to specifically to rebuild the temple. But the walls were still down. There were no defenses. It was, uh, the homes were still destroyed. They went back simply and, and importantly to, to rebuild the temple. Now, Nehemiah, our hero for, for the day, uh, was a second or third generation Jew after the captivity. And he was now serving as cupbearer to the king. Cupbearer, anybody, whether they're the, the, those guarding the king or the cupbearer, the one that tasted the food or whatever, anybody in the king's presence, it was a high level of responsibility. It was a high level of trust. Uh, the king, uh, as, it, as most kings, they surround themselves with the people that they trust and that make and quite honestly, that made them look good. And so Nehemiah is in the presence of the king as cupbearer. It's maybe one of the riskier jobs, uh, but nevertheless, he was in the presence of the king. The cupbearer would be in charge of tasting whatever was, uh, was brought to the king to drink prior to giving it to the king. And then he waited and watched and see if anything happened. Because poisoning was a very popular way of getting rid of those that were in charge or those that you wanted to get rid of. So he had an important job, and it was a, a, a job of high honor and respect. Nehemiah means comfort of God. This comfort was not, this did not mean for Nehemiah to be comfortable. Because Nehemiah was already comfortable. He was being taken care of. All those in the king's service were very well taken care of. Again, the better they look, the better the king looks. And so they were very well taken care of. So Nehemiah was already comfortable. Nehemiah was called to bring God's comfort to his people. And with that, I want to get started reading in the book of Nehemiah. Uh, chapter 1, and verses 1 to 4, if you're following along. The words of Nehemiah, the son of Hakaliah. Now it happened in the month of Chislev, in the 20th year, as I was in Susa, the citadel, that Hanani, one of my brothers, came with certain men from Judah, from J Jerusalem, from uh, where they had all been taken from. And I asked them concerning the Jews who escaped and who would survive the exile concerning Jerusalem. And they said to me, the remnant there in the province who have survived the exile are in great trouble and shame. The wall of Jerusalem is broken down and its gates are destroyed by fire. As soon as I heard these words, I sat down and wept and mourned for days. And I continued fasting and praying before the God of heaven. I want to take this section here and break it down just a little bit. Um, in this, I want to focus on uh, verse 4 here. Nehemiah heard the, about the conditions in Jerusalem and it, it impacted him greatly. We do not know if he heard this for the first time or I, I personally, it's a, it's a first that it's written about in the book. I personally believe that if he was in the king's service, he had heard other reports. He had, this was not the first time that he heard about the condition or uh, how the Jews were doing. But this time, 
it greatly impacted him. From verse 4, as soon as I heard these words, I sat down and wept and mourned for days. And I continued fasting and praying before the God of heaven. Nehemiah, as I mentioned, probably did not hear these things for the first time. But this time, it sunk in. This time, he let it in. This time, it impacted him. This time, it was different. This time, he was not, he could not be sane. It broke him. And that's, that's a very key thing. We hear things all the time. We, we've, we've heard some scriptures maybe a hundred times, maybe more. We've heard and, uh, scriptural advice and guidance. We've heard, we hear things all the time. But a lot of it goes right over. A lot of it goes right around. A lot of it, it it's maybe there for a moment and then it, then it goes beyond. But this, Nehemiah heard. And he allowed it to affect him, to impact him. He identified with the need this time. Now, Nehemiah had a perfect excuse. He, he, he had a good job. He had, he, would, he had a responsible job. Good meaning in the sense of, I'm sure he had plenty of food. Clothing was taken care of. The housing was taken care of. The other spa things or whatever else would be involved to keep someone in, uh, in, in tip-top condition and appearance. All those things were there, so he was well taken care of. He was comfortable. He had an excuse. He had a job. This is my job. I don't want to lose, lose this. But he did not behind, hide behind his position in order to avoid the need. The need hit him. It sunk in. And, and he was broken. Part of the same verse, moving on just a little bit, Nehemiah 1 4. As soon as I heard these words, and he heard, I sat down and wept and mourned for days. And I continued fasting and praying before the God of heaven. Again, he allowed this to settle in. This, he heard it, it broke him, and for several days, he's, he's, he's talking about this just overcoming him. And, and changing him. And we don't know everything that he prayed or that he went through or whatever, but he was greatly impacted. The third part here from Nehemiah 1 4 is he prayed. As soon as I heard these words, I sat down and wept and mourned for days, and I continued fasting and praying before the God of heaven. This was his work time. This was his time when he fasted and prayed. This is where it went beyond the emotional, beyond being overcome, beyond uh, being overtaken, overrun by what impacted him. And it got into the work part of it. Into the, Lord, show me what to do. Holy Spirit, what are you What are you leading and guiding me on? What, what do you, what is... Why am I so impacted on this? Is there something you want me to do? And if so, what is it? That's what, that's what he sorted out during his prayer time and his fasting time. Uh, when we do that, when we pray and when we fast, when we, uh, when we take time, we're sorting out and uh, our, our habits, our thoughts, our will, our emotions, we're sorting that out from God's. We're, we're separating, we're, we're figuring out what's from God and what's from me. So that was a very important time for Nehemiah to, uh, to, to get to that point. Because when we get to verses 5 to 10 in chapter 1, uh, Nehemiah prays for his people in verses 5 to 10. And he, it's a very heartfelt prayer. It's a prayer of, of, uh, of confession of the sins of Israel. Confession of for his own sins and the sins of his family, and just begging and asking God to be merciful and, and to provide comfort, to provide uh, for his people, not forget his people. It was an awesome prayer. And I move on to verse 11 here, right after this, where he this one, this part of it is recorded. O oh Lord, let your ear be attentive to the prayer of your servant and to the prayer of your servants who delight to fear your name, and give success to your servant today, 
and grant him mercy in the sight of this man. He says, Now I was cut bearer to the king. At the end of this time of prayer and fasting, at the end of that comes out. We, we already know what he's going to do, and we'll read some more of that in just a second. But he's asking for favor and for mercy, success to your, he says to your servant today, that is himself, to, to, he's praying for that for himself, success for himself, and grant, grant him mercy in the sight of this man, meaning the king. He knows he needs to speak to the king about it. Okay? Those three actions he heard, he let it sink in, he prayed and fasted. Fourth action here I want to go over. And that's it found in Nehemiah chapter 2, the very next, uh, very next verses, chapter 2, verses 1 to 8. He acted on what God had shown him. In the month of Nisan, in the 20th year of King Artaxerxes, when wine was before him, I took up the wine and gave it to the king. Now I had not been sad in his presence. And the king said to me, why is your face sad, seeing you are not sick? This is nothing but sadness of the heart. Then I was very much afraid. I said to the king, let the king live forever. <laughs> Probably maybe a, a desperation thing, he knew. Nehemiah knew what he was going to be saying. Let the king live forever. Why should not my face be sad when the city, the place of my father's graves, lies in ruins and its gates have been destroyed by fire? Now remember, he's talking to the king of the country that did this. So not in his generation, but in previous generations. Then the king said to me, what are you requesting? So I prayed to the God of heaven, and I said to the king, if it pleases the king, and if your servant has found favor in your sight, then you send me to Judah, to the city of my father's graves, that I may rebuild it. And the king said to me, with the queen sitting beside him, how long will you be gone, and when will you return? So it pleased the king to send me when I had given him a time. And I said to the king, if it pleases the king, let letters be given me to the governors of the province beyond the river, that they may let me pass through until I come to Judah. And a letter to Asaph, the keeper of the king's forest, that he may give me timber to make beams for the gates of the fortress of the temple, and for the wall of the city, and for the house that I shall occupy. And the king granted me what I asked, for the good hand of my God was upon me. The very next verse, he's already, I mean, there was some time passed. We don't know how much time passed. But the very next verse in the book of Nehemiah is how he's handing the letters that he received from the king to the magistrates along the way to get to grant him safe passage. He was already on his way. Nehemiah, this pattern of hearing, letting it sink in and have impact, Praying, praying with intensity and with earnest, earnestness, and then doing or acting. Those, that pattern is repeated in the book of Nehemiah over and over and over again. That, those things that I talked to you about earlier, about what's in the book, those things were bathed in these four actions. And that's the model. That's the, that's, that's the part of Nehemiah that I want to point out and, and expand on this morning. His call was to bring comfort and protection to his fellow Jews in, in Jerusalem by rebuilding the wall. The, the Jews in Jerusalem, probably after all this time, thought they were forgotten. Thought that this is, this is, this is as good as it was going to get. There were attempts to rebuild. There were attempts to, to fix up. But there were also enemies in that land. And with the walls down, those enemies could control whatever they wanted. They did not, the enemies did not want that the walls to be rebuilt because 
that took the, the more esteemed and the more uh, protection and uh, gave, the walls gave Jerusalem some of their power back that they had before. Well, if they're gaining power, the, those around are losing power, losing access, losing influence, and they did not want that. So there were many attempts to, to, to try and do this. And Nehemiah, when he did go, faced some of those same people with the threats. And again, some of them were fixed physical. They wanted to kill. They wanted to, they wanted to destroy what he was doing. And, and yet he kept going and handled it, again, praying and handling it with God's way. God never forgot the people of Jerusalem. He, over a hundred years had passed by this time, and he never forgot them. And, but I'm sure, I, I have no doubt that they were virtually convinced that God had forgotten them because their lives had not changed. Their, their situation was dire. And so they most likely forgot that God, or felt that God had forgotten them. The application for us is that we get that way sometimes too. Sometimes it lasts just a moment. Sometimes, sometimes for days, for weeks, for months, for years. We, because our conditions haven't changed, because something uh, hasn't worked out, because some, something uh, is, is pressuring us, uh, we get the feeling that God has forgotten us. Or maybe he's not forgotten us, but he, but he is busy someplace else. Or this is my lot. This is, this must be what God wants me to do. And none of those things are true. None of those things are true. God has not forgotten us. I want to read from Galatians 2.20. I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who, who lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. We can never forget that Jesus came. He, he left the comforts of heaven to do what he did on this earth. He left the comforts of heaven. And we can say anything we want. Oh, yeah, well, he got to go back. Yes, we can say all that, but he still lived 33 years on this earth. And as we all know, he faced challenges, we faced challenges. His biggest challenge was when he, when he faced death. And he did that for us. He, and then when he left, he didn't leave to get away from us. He left to send the Holy Spirit to always be with us and always minister in and through and to, and to us. He had, he's not separated from us at all. The Holy Spirit resides in us and is, and is bringing us everything that Father God, Jesus, and Holy Spirit want to accomplish in our life. I want to read from Ephesians 1, 16 to 19. I have not stopped giving thanks for you, remembering you in my prayers. I keep asking that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious Father, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation so that you may know him better. I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which he has called you, the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints for his holy people and his incomparable great power for us who believe. I want to read this last part again, that you may know the hope to which he has called you, the riches of Riches of his glorious inheritance in, in the saints or in his holy people, and his incomparably great power for us who believe. Nothing is held back from us. Nothing. And I know that's not our experience sometimes. I know that we go through the, the valleys, we go through the tough things. I go through them too. We all do. As long as we're on this planet, we're going to have our tough times and our tough things. But God desires that it be different than that, that we not get stuck there, that we not 
get uh, in a circling pattern around the problem or around the issue or around the pain, but that we go through that valley to the other side. Romans 8, 37 and 39. No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am sure that neither death nor life, nor angels nor rulers, nor things present nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Nothing, nothing, nothing able to separate us from Jesus Christ our Lord. Nothing. And I know it's going to some, some hearts and minds, and I, it's okay. I, I've been there myself sometimes. We think, well, that's good, and that's right, and I believe it, but, and we stick a butt in there, and we have an excuse. And it's, it's not a godly excuse. It's, a, it's something that the enemy has inserted, or it wants us to believe. He doesn't want us to be victorious. He doesn't want us to, to, to get on top of what we're going through and, and, and experiencing right now. The enemy works against us all the time. But we have this assurance in all these things. And do not think, I, I beg you, do not think that what your thing is, is the exception. Because it isn't. It is included in this. In all things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. Jesus said himself that, that he needed to go when he was on this earth. And again, it wasn't to get away from us. It was he needed to go so that he could send the Holy Spirit. And when I see that, I see Jesus telling us that the Holy Spirit is going, it has, it has what you need from this point on. So the Holy Spirit is there for us to draw on, to lean on, to go to, to listen to, to respond to, because he has what we need. Now the enemy will try to talk us out of that also, but the Holy Spirit has everything that we need. From Ephesians 3, 16 to 19. According to the riches of his glory, you may be strengthened with power through his spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may have strength to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and width and height and depth, and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. The, the NIV says it a little, little bit differently as far as filled with all the fullness of God, that we may know the love of Christ. It says that we may know how wide, farther than I can reach, how long, this way, how high and how deep is the love of Christ. We cannot comprehend how much God loves us. We get glimpses of it. We, and, and we we get that feeling or that knowledge sometimes, but we, our God's desire is that we know how much he loves us all the time and that we not get talked out of it, that we not be persuaded away from it, that we not uh, be distracted from that. Jesus didn't just come to save us and then set us on our way, and he'll see us, see you later, see you in heaven. That is not why he came. He came for salvation, and that is certainly, certainly important, but he also came to show us the way, and to give us the tools to overcome, and to get through, and to be victorious, and to lead others. It's, it's not just about us. You know, like I said earlier, Nehemiah was comfortable. This was not about him being more comfortable uh, when, when God spoke to him through that, through that person who gave the report. It was about him getting something to somebody else. And for Nehemiah, it was, getting, it was him giving up his comfortable life for somebody else. But for us, and for some of us, it may be the same thing. 
But for others of us, it might be, and I think this is more often the case because we get bogged down here. It, for, for most of us, it's that he has something that he wants to deal with, help with, come alongside with, help steer us through personally so that we can then get in a position where we can take something to somebody else. Man, so many of us are bogged down in our own things that we're not able, even, if, even though there may be desire, and there probably is desire there to help somebody else. We're so bogged down in our own things that, that we are unable to help somebody else. And I know that everybody here knows that God loves If I was to say, does God love you, the answer would be, yes. Okay. Does God protect you? Yes. Okay. Does he, has he saved you? Yes. Okay. Does he heal you? Yes. Okay. We, we know that from a, from a general, I didn't get specific, I, I, I made general statements. We know that and agree with that from a general stand, statement standpoint. But what we've got to change and what we've what I'm challenging all of us, myself included, with this morning, is that we need to make it personal. He does love us enough to meet us where we're at with whatever we're going through to, so that he can take us to the other side, so that he can take us through that valley and see us through to the other side. And the thing that is coming to your mind right now, the thought that's there, or maybe that's that maybe for the first time, or maybe multiple times, maybe it's been there for years. He wants to help you with that. He wants to get you through to the other side. He loves you. He loves me, he loves you. And that love goes far deeper than what we can ever imagine. And that love includes good things in our life. Good things that, and, and if it's a bad thing, it's, it's not from God. We might be challenged with things because we live in a fallen world. We sometimes do stupid things ourselves. And there are other factors and people that also live in this world that sometimes cause us grief. But our God does not bring us bad things. Our God wants to take those things, turn them around. Romans 8, 28, all things work together for good for those that love the Lord and diligently seek Him. He wants to take those things that, that we're mired in, that we're stuck in, that we're caught up in, that we feel buried by, that we're depressed by, that we're, that we're overcome by. He wants to take those things. And with His guidance, not, not our own will, not our own uh, skills or whatever, our talents, but with God's help, he promises in that scripture to take whatever comes against us and turn it into something good. And that is absolutely amazing. That's the God we serve. That is the God that we have. The God of the universe wants to take whatever comes against us and turn it into something good. That is absolutely amazing. 1 Thessalonians 5, 23. Now may the God of peace sanctify you completely and may your whole spirit, soul, and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus did not come just for our spiritual life. He came so that we could be whole in mind, which is our, 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 th our thoughts, our will and emotions, our, and, our, and our, our, I'm sorry, our soulish realm is our, our mind, our will and emotions, in our body, and in our spiritual health. He wants us healthy in all areas because he knows that if we're not healthy in one of those areas, it affects the other, the other two. So he is after restoring us and, and, and helping us with every aspect of our life. The Word of God, I've read, a lot, I've read several scriptures this morning, and actually many of them, I bet you some of them are those that I said earlier you've heard a hundred times or more. They're not uncommon or uh, hard to find uh, or rarely used scriptures, but they are powerful. It's the Word of God that gets us out of ourselves, gets us 
out of the thinking that we've fallen into, whether it's a lie from the devil or whether it's how we were brought up or whether it, it, we, from a trusted friend or whatever, it gets us out of our own things, out of our own shell, out of our own way of doing things into doing things God's way. And that's seeing how God wants it done and how it can be done and then, and then the benefits that come from that. And he's, God is never trying to take anything away from us. He's, he's, he's wanting to accept us where we're at and take us to a better place. For the word of God, Hebrews 4, 12, the word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the, to the division of soul and spirit, of joints and of marrow, discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. The word of God, we are a spirit, a soul, and a body, and it takes some real sorting out once we become a follower of Jesus. It, it, takes, it takes thinking about things differently, seeing things differently, see, uh, and uh, looking at how God looks at things, and then responding how God responds. It, we have to get out of our normal input, our normal surroundings, and get in front of the Word of God. And, and pray and ask the Holy Spirit to lead and guide us if we're ever going to change. It does not happen by osmosis. It does not happen by sitting next to someone who's on fire. It, it only happen, it happens from the inside out. And the Word of God is the primary way in which it happens. And then the Holy Spirit is there ministering to us, ministering and explaining and reminding us of the Word of God so that we can apply it in every situation. I asked this morning, what is God bringing to your attention? What, what is God laying on your heart right now? It may be fresh this morning. Most likely, it's something that's been there for a while. Sometimes, the answer to that question, what is God laying on your heart? I'll ask it a different way. What are you avoiding? Where, where, when you, when you hear it brought up, in effect, your arms go like this, which is kind of the universal sign that you're protecting yourself, closing yourself off, not really listening to or being a part of what's going on. So some, for some, it's what you've been fighting. It's what uh, God wants to get something to you, but he is a gentleman, he does not force anything. He offers, he gives opportunity. He, he invites, it's up to us to respond. Once we hear, and that's, that is critical, if we don't hear, we skip, we skip the other steps, the other three that I mentioned. We need to hear first what God is saying to us. And once we hear that, then allow God to impact us. Allow Him to affect you in that area of your life. Believe, believe that He wants to help you. The enemy will tell you everything to keep you away from God. He'll lie in any way he can. He'll tell you whatever you're willing to believe to keep you so that you don't invite God into that area of your life. There is nothing good about the enemy because then he takes that thing and turns it into an accusation. When we fall on Twitter, when we, when we sin, then he turns right around and, and accuses us of it. You loser. See, that's your failure. You thought you were saved. You're, you're still doing the same things. The enemy turns that all around. But God is inviting us to take that thing, whatever it is. And it could be a relationship. It could be, it could be things relating to money. It could be about forgiveness. It could be... I hesitate to even say certain things because I don't want to lead anybody in a direction. It's whatever God is speaking to you. Take that thing. 
spend time with God, allow that, turn it over to him and allow that thing to be taken in and believe that he wants to change, that he wants to help you with it. Believe him on that. And then pray for it. Pray so that you don't handle it or toss it aside like maybe you have in the past. But pray that you handle it differently this time. That you find out God's plan on how to walk through it. Pray. And then pray until you have a clear picture of the path forward. And it might only be one step. It might not be everything. It might only be one step. But take that step. To hear. To let it sink in. To pray. And then to do what God is leading us to. That's the message from Nehemiah. Now let me pray over you this morning. Father God, I thank you for this day. I thank you for this message. I thank you for Nehemiah. And I pray, I pray that the message today goes way beyond what I've spoken. That it goes deep into hearts. That it goes into good soil. The soil, the, this, the soil that will bear much fruit. For some, much fruit in their own life or in their family's life. For others, fruit for those outside their family, or a missional, kind of a missional aspect. But Father, I pray that fruit is born of this. I thank you. I thank you that you're so awesome. I thank you that you're such a loving God. You never leave us or forsake us. You want to help us through this life. You want to help us be victorious. You want to help us get to the other side of whatever is facing us. And I thank you that you love us so much. In Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Amen. Amen.